Um, and we'll go straight to Chris, if that's okay, to cover LB34. Yes. Uh, well, first of all, Ashley, thank you for having me today. And we're really happy to be part of this presentation and to talk about our work, um, LB34. Um, we do have uh, some some really great bills coming up next week on, on, on sentencing reform, and LB34 is one of those. Um, and so I guess I'll, I'll first just give a little bit, a little bit of background about our office's involvement in these, these issues and kind of how, how we can, how, how LB34 came to be. Um, as I think everybody on this, um, on this, um, on this Zoom knows, um, we've had an overcrowding crisis uh, in our prisons in Nebraska for, for quite some time. It's been something that the legislature has uh, sought to try to resolve, has passed legislation uh, in the past. LB 605 uh, was one of those bills that was passed intended to try to resolve a number of our, um, of our, our, our problems in the overcrowding of our prisons. Uh, really what happened with LB 605 is it didn't, while it had some really good reforms in it and some really good measures in it, uh, it didn't it didn't go far enough on on things like sentencing reform to really uh, look at those numbers and get those numbers reduced down. And so um, that's been an area that we've worked on in our office to try to bring legislation that really tackles that sentencing side. And so there were recommendations made at the time um, from from uh, from from CSG um, and other organizations to look at, at those sentencing reforms. And so um, what we've done is um, actually introduced a number of bills that have looked at the sentencing side of this. And, um, and LB 34 is one of those bills, one of those really important bills to look at how we can reduce our overcrowding crisis um, on the sentencing side. And so there's two major components to LB 34. It does two big themes. And um, both, of, both of those big things were bills that we brought in the past, and this year we combined them into one bill because they both get at much of the same things. Uh, and one of those is LB30, one of those um, actually uh, um, changes provisions for crimes committed by a person under 21 uh, to eliminate life without parole sentences. And so that's really the big thing that the bill does. But it also has a second component too. It, re it uh, removes mandatory minimum sentences for uh, class 1, 1C and 1D felonies. Those are the two felony classifications that have, that have, that have the mandatory minimum sentences. And so um, that bill also eliminates those for persons under 21 years of age as well. And we thought that those issues kind of went together really well. So we decided to combine them into the same bill this year. And so, as I said before, these were two different bills that she brought last biennium. Uh, we didn't get as much traction on those bills, obviously, as we wanted. We had the county attorneys and some other groups uh, that were um, mostly the county attorneys um, that opposed uh, these sentencing reforms. And so, um, you know, really our hope is in bringing it this year that now that we actually see a proposal being made to uh, build a new prison in our state, I think, you know, our hope is that that reality has set into the legislature, you know, that we need to do something on the sentencing side. It's a much better investment of taxpayer dollars and a much more humane approach to look at alternatives for to building a new prison. And so, um, as I said, we have a number of bills that look at this and LB 34 is one of those. We have the hearing on this um, on this next Wednesday. And I'm just going to kind of give you a little bit of background on um, kind of how the juvenile life without parole um, kind of came into this uh, this LB 34. Uh, in in 2012, um, some of you probably already know this, so some of this may be um, information that uh, is a little bit um, 
you know, things that the people on this already know. But I want to I want to repeat it again, just because I think some people may not be aware of some of the history of how the courts have ruled on these issues. And in 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 2012, in Miller versus Alabama, the U.S. Supreme Court struck down life without parole sentences for most juvenile homicide offenses and ruled that courts must, quote, take into account how children are different and how those differences counsel against irrevocably sentencing them to lifetime in prison, unquote. Uh, the court then followed up in 2016, Montgomery versus Louisiana, that, quote, even if a court considers a child's age before sentencing him or her to a lifetime in prison, that sentence still violates the Eighth Amendment for a child whose, whose crime reflects unfortunate yet transient immaturity, unquote. This immaturity is documented in numerous studies which show that a juvenile's brain isn't fully developed until age 25 or 26. And so we've, there's a lot of really great research. Uh, I know the organizations involved in this, um, in this Zoom have also been um, part of uh, producing some of that research, the Sentencing Project, Nebraskans for Prison Reform. Um, obviously, uh, we know that there's a lot of really good data and research on that. And so, you know, part of our message in bringing this bill is that children are are different, that they should be treated differently. And I was kind of struck by um, something that actually came out. The sentencing um, project um, has, has data that shows violent crime arrests by age in the US. And you can just see when you look at that, you know, you look at the ages in which those violent crime arrests are, are at their peak. And you can clearly see that there's something going on in, the, in that age range when a, a child is younger and when they're still a youth uh, forming, their brain is still forming into becoming an adult. You can see where a lot of those decisions are made during that age range and how those numbers go down. And so I think what that tells us is, you know, it just reinforces we have to we have to look at this differently. We have to look at the uh, things that are happening early on in a person's life and how that weighs in, and uh, and looking at ways that we can provide opportunities for people as they get older and not take away their hope. And so um, that's part of what LB thirty four does is it looks at. Um, um, you know, when we're sentencing a, a youth under 18 to life in prison without parole, we're sentencing them to die in prison. We're taking away all that hope. And so that's a big part of why um, we decided to bring that bill and why we're going to really push to get that through this legislative session. The other piece of this bill, as I, as I mentioned, um, was the mandatory minimum side. Uh, in 2014, the Iowa Supreme Court held in state versus Lyle that, quote, one size fits all mandatory minimum sentences were unconstitutional when applied to juveniles, uh, finding, uh, finding such sentences, uh, quote, cannot satisfy the standard of decency and fairness embedded in Article I, Section uh, 17 of the Iowa State Constitution. And so um, that, you know, that, that kind of decision further forces what we're talking about with the juvenile life without parole issue as well. And that's why we thought these issues worked really well in the same bill. And so, um, you know, really what we're looking at here is, um, you know, how we can have these proposals out there to really make a case that these are the things we need to be doing to, to move our state forward. And um, as I stated earlier, you know, with, with that new prison, they say that it would be, um, they're saying that it would be 230 million, you know, we've seen 450 million estimate for building a new prison is likely to be way more than that. And, you know, there's just a lot of issues that go into um, the, you know, there's a lot of problems that go into the building of a new prison. Obviously, we're not tackling the root of the problem and what's really contributing to the overcrowding crisis that, um, you know, um, we can't build our way out of this problem. Um, and that's something that I think we need to continue to get that message across. And then there's other issues with building a new prison as well. How do we staff a new prison? You know, we can't even staff the prisons that we have right now. And we're talking about building a new prison. 
And, you know, part of the problem with the understaffing of our current prisons, prisons is how it's impacting programming in prison as well, which is, of course, another issue related to all of this. And so that's another, you know, that's another thing that we need to be tackling when we look at this overcrowding crisis. But really, we can't do it with, uh, without looking at these sentencing reforms. And so that's part of the reason why we brought LB34. And um, we really appreciate um, all the support of, uh, of, of all of you. And uh, we look forward to having a good hearing next Wednesday. Uh, on this, and hopefully, um, you know, it will. It's the kind of thing that now that the reality of this pr proposal for a new prison is hitting. Um, hopefully, then the reality that we need to do, we really do need to look at these sentencing alternatives um, to building a new prison is going to hit home with a number of senators. So we need all the support we can get. We need um, we need letters. Um, contact your senators. Let them know. Um, that, you know, this is something that we need to be uh, tackling. It's a smarter approach uh, and a better approach, a more humane approach to uh, tackling our overcrowding crisis. And we should add that with Brent Bisbert and Chris, and he's representing Nebraska because we have some national uh, individuals here, but we should add here in Nebraska that if, in 20 years is not a long time for a prison, a new prison. And we just had a new prison in 20, open up in 2021. And that thing was built in no time. And where did all them numbers come before? And now we're, we're number two, I think it is, in overcrowding in the nation. Little old Nebraska. If we don't think that a new prison, that we'll just find a way to fill this up and still our, our DOC, our Department of Corrections is the one that's been speaking for years of having staffing problems that this is not gonna be a major problem. That's something just for the practical mind, let alone for pushing the, root, the, the interest of reform to have people come out better for our society, which is what your bill is asking for. Absolutely. And one of the things that we keep saying, if you build it, they will come. Um, you know, it's, it's that kind of thing. The space will be filled if we build it. And that's exactly what we don't want. It, it's a way of, of not addressing the underlying issues of the overcrowding and why we have overcrowding. So um, if, we, if we build it, it will get filled. <laughs> that's exactly it. And it's, it's quite an almost bizarre proposition to build a new prison with NDCS are quite open about they have no plans to help get people out, to stop getting people in, no plans to work with judges, to work with prosecutors, anything like that. And as you've brought up, the, the cost and the staffing is one of the most bizarre elements, is that, I mean, in Alabama, the only place worse than us for overcrowding at the moment, they're first, we're second, they have a new prison built to try and deal with this problem. And it's 500 million over what it was supposed to be, not 500 million, 500 million over. And that's what happens every time. I actually coincidentally am from the building trade originally, and there's just nothing comes in. And that's certainly nothing comes in under budget and it barely comes in on budget, especially public projects. The staffing element as well, that the argument is that it's more central, but they can't staff uh, Nebraska State Penitentiary, which is the most central building in the capital, you know, as the most central correctional facility in the capital. So bizarre. So yeah, we need to do something about the sensing and this is, far and away the bill that will make the most difference with that. So thank you so much for that, Chris. That was great. Thank you. And I see there is a question on there. Who has the authority to decide whether building a new prison, whether building a new prison or not? And it would be the appropriations committee that would that would pass a uh, appropriation to do that. And the legislature would, would be ultimately uh, deciding whether or not to appropriate those dollars to a new prison. So you got kind of a, diff a couple different committees involved in uh, how the legislature chooses to move forward on the overcrowding crisis, the appropriations committee and, uh, and also judiciary, which we're on. And so those are the, those are the bills that, ha that have the, uh, the, that's the committee that hears the bills that we're talking about, um, LB 34 and, and, uh, and some of these other sentencing reform bills. So it's kind of a joint thing between the, those two committees right now. And we have two very quick questions that I'll just take just now because I'll make uh, John's part very quick. 
Um, Dwayne has asked if there's any plans to change from under 21 to 21. I know the normal language is to be under, so under 18 or under 21, but just if you could possibly clarify, Chris. Uh, to go from, okay, just make sure I understand that, to go to go from 21 and under or, or under 21. Because right I, now the bill says under under 21. Yeah, is there any plans to make it include 21? We are not aware there, of there, ha there have been um, there have been some questions about whether or not we could amend the bill to uh, increase that to include age 21. And I, I think it's fair to say that's something that we're looking at and uh, and would would certainly entertain if it seems uh, amenable. Obviously, we want to try to get as, as good a bill as we can passed in the legislature. And I know that um, that's something that we would obviously like to see that age higher than, than, than 21. So if we can amend it to include 21, I think that's something that she would be certainly amenable to. Sure, thank you. Uh, the last question, is there any provisions for mental health in children that 34 really deals with 18 to 18, 19, 20, rather than uh, juveniles under that, doesn't it, if I'm correct? Yeah, it, it just goes, so it basically takes the age up from 18, which the Supreme Court has already ruled the, the under 18, so this extends it to uh, 21, so basically three additional years. Perfect, thank you. That's brilliant. Thank you so much, Chris. Uh, obviously, we'd love for you to stay, but I understand it's Saturday and uh, you may want to hop off, but thank you so much for your time. Thank you for having me. All right, and we will have Louis next, if that's possible, to talk about his work uh, very briefly with Cut 50 and how that kind of ties into our problems with overcrowding and bills to, to take the overcrowding crisis down. Well, thanks so much for having me, uh, especially having this very important conversation on a Saturday. Um, I also want to acknowledge uh, the Nebraskans uh, for prison reform uh, and, and, and just, the, just the work that you guys are doing and all of the other panelists and, and speakers who want to be uh, speaking today. So uh, very briefly, my name is Louis L. Reed. I am the Director of National Organizing and Partnerships for Dream Corps Justice, formerly known as Cut 50. Uh, our organization is co-founded by two very dynamic individuals, one who happens to be uh, Van Jones, CNN political commentator, and also Jessica Jackson, who is the legal mentor to Kim Kardashian. And over the last four years, we have emerged uh, immodestly, I always say this, as the winningest criminal justice organization in recent history, having passed more than 30 bills in less than four years, including the Federal First Step Act. And what our focus is at Dream Court Justice, formerly known as Cut 50, uh, the reason why I keep saying Dream Court Justice, formerly known as Cut 50, is because I have to get used to it. We've, we're only uh, about two weeks into the new name. Uh, but you know, we close prison doors and we open windows of opportunity. That's what our focus is. And we have um, not just passed more than uh, approximately 30 bills over the last four years, but including including in that, in, in, that, um, in that context was the Federal First Step Act. The Federal First Step Act was the only criminal justice reform bill that was passed during the last administration, uh, during the Trump administration that the New York Times calls the most significant criminal justice reform bill in a generation dating all the way back to the 1994 crime bill. You may be asking yourself, how is this issue important to me? What's my why? Why am I connected to this issue? What am I even doing here today? I'm talking about the need for reform uh, on the state level, considering that I do national work. I'm glad that you asked that question. I served nearly 14 years in federal prison, nearly 14 years in federal prison. And during the time that I was in, I realized one thing that was absolutely paramount to the work that I'm doing now. Those closest to the problem are also closest to the solution, but often furthest from resources and power. Let me say that one more time for the people in the back. Those closest to the problem are also closest to the solution, but often furthest from resources and power. And so we believe in building coalition. We believe in having conversations like this. We believe in ensuring that people who have been impacted by the issue, that they are not just front and center, but their voices are the center of gravity when we are making decisions as the conversation is centered around today. Look, I wanna drop something on you um, that I just, just discovered relatively recently. 
in Nebraska, black people constitute 5% of the state's residents, 5% of the state's residents, but 21% of the people in jail and 29% of the people in prison are black. That is absolutely problematic. Since 1970, the jail population has increased by 350%. That's as of 2015 in the state of Nebraska. And pretrial detainees constitute 73% of the total jail population in Nebraska. And so I can tell you, we need to be we need to be creating springboards of opportunities rather than trapdoors to failures for the people in the state of Nebraska. We don't need to be talking about prisons being open. We need to be talking about schools being open. We need to be talking about institutions of, of higher education being open. We need to be talking about creating opportunities, creating windows of opportunities for people who have been impacted by the criminal legal system in the state of Nebraska, rather than perpetuating trans and or uh, intergenerational uh, uh, um, uh, behaviors and or pathologies of, 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 of the issues that we're talking about today. Look, this is common common sense. This is common sense. We need to ensure that Nebraskans, especially those individuals who are disproportionately impacted by the criminal legal system, that there's equity, that there's fairness, and that there's that, that there's a, a degree of justice, not just us, not just us, but there's a degree of justice as it relates to the administration of such in the courtrooms. So look, last but not least, because I'm not going to be before you long, last but not least, I also want to say this. That is the reason why we are organizing the National Day of Empathy. You may be asking yourself, what is the National Day of Empathy? I'm glad that you asked that question as well, because I'm going to answer it. The National Day of Empathy is the nation's largest day of action around social and criminal justice reform. You may be asking yourself, how did you guys pass the those 30 bills how do you how did you guys pass those 30 bills over the last four years we did it through the national day of empathy we did it through grassroots organizers we did it through people who are closest to the problem and understand the solution so you may be asking yourself how can we get involved how can i uh, be tweeting at my state senators how can i get involved in in in, in uh, the action around the national day of empathy i'm going to tell you it's very simple you can text the word empathy to 97483. Again, that word is empathy to 97483. Look, we are going to be organizing literally in all 50 states and all four corners of our country. We are going to be talking about bills that need to be passed. We are going to be talking about prisons that need to be closed. We're gonna be talking about schools that need to be open. We are going to be talking about all points of action that you can quite possibly imagine as it relates to our criminal legal system. And so we're gonna be having pe folks like Kim Kardashian, Van Jones, Jessica Jackson, Vic Mensa, Bishop T.D. Jakes. I mean, we got the who's who of everybody who is going to be involved in the National Day of Empathy. We have virtual events such as this, virtual events such as this, uh, that's going to be deployed all throughout the day on March 2nd. So if you want to know how you can uh, be involved in your state specifically, text the word empathy to 97483. I look forward to seeing you there. I look forward to not just having conversations around how we can close uh, uh, prison doors in the state of Nebraska, but I look forward to having conversations with you about how we can open up windows of opportunity for Nebraskans uh, in all four corners of your state. Thanks so much for having me. Thanks so much, Lewis. And I think I can wholeheartedly say calling you Louis for this entire time is the easiest way to identify me as British rather than American. So apologies, and I will correct that going forward. Um, I think it's an absolutely excellent point how close the incarcerated are to the solutions. And that's why Nebraskans for Prison Reform, their board, uh, informal as it is at the moment, is largely made up of the incarcerated as well as as people outside who want to bring the resources and the power to them to be able to implement the best solutions. LB624, which I gave a very brief overview at the beginning, is actually written by somebody who's currently incarcerated. So really a great way to bring their experience and their ability to solve problems out into the open as well. Thank you so much for that, Lewis. Um, so if we could move on to Nicole to give us an overview of her work with the Sentencing Project, who do a lot of 
who do focus a largely on life without parole uh, and other such things. So I'll let her tell you more. Thanks, Ashley. And thanks, Nebraskans, for prison reform for hosting this important discussion. We do have a national campaign to end life imprisonment, but our work you know, predates the launch of that campaign at the end of 2018 and goes back to the mid 80s in terms of tracking the growth of incarceration over the years and the underlying causes for it. Um, and so we've been doing that work nationally within the federal level, but I have been managing the sentencing project state portfolio for a long time and you know, wanna focus my comments today on life imprisonment and our campaign to end life imprisonment work, which folks can find online at endlifeimprisonment.org. We've so appreciated Nebraskans for Prison Reform and other state partners in Nebraska for connecting with us um, and for anchoring conversations on legislative reform in the state to help address life imprisonment. You know, and this conversation today, in particular with um, Chris from Senator Pansy Brick's office starting us off have been, you know, really helpful in grounding efforts to challenge mass incarceration and life imprisonment and practical efforts that are being considered by Nebraska lawmakers. And I'll just say that similar reforms are being um, seriously considered in other states around the country, including in the Midwest and Iowa in Missouri, but in also in other states uh, like California, New York, Alabama, and a handful of other states, there actually might be a serious effort to repeal life without parole as a sentencing option period in the state of Vermont. This year, last year during the 2020 legislative session, a measure to repeal life without parole as a sentencing option was voted out of the Vermont State Senate and got held up in committee when COVID, uh, when the pandemic started. So the coalition in support of that repeal bill will be working to reintroduce that legislation this year and are very confident that the state is ready to repeal life without parole as a sentencing option for all persons um, sentenced to life without parole in addition to young adults and youth uh, complying with what the Supreme Court um, rules change dating back to 2012 and the effort in Nebraska and other states like California and uh, locally where I live in the District of Columbia have been working to expand out Miller and Graham um, changes to young adults and emerging adult populations. But the state of Vermont um, is poised to actually repeal the sentencing option for all individuals regardless at the, of the age at their time of conviction. And if so, um, you know, might start a trend that I think will have a lot of momentum in the Northeast in particular around repealing these very extreme sentences, not just in Vermont, but in other states in the Northeast like Maine and Massachusetts. So, uh, you know, I'll say that behind many of the statistics that the sentencing project promotes, are you know people in building off of what uh, Lewis said earlier? We know that you know these percentage points represent people's individual stories, and the data sets that we work with represent entire communities that are impacted and disappeared by mass incarceration. Some of the statistics have already been shared, um, you know, earlier in this conversation, and many of you know this. But as of 2019, nearly 6,000 persons were imprisoned in Nebraska prisons, according to the Bureau of Justice Statistics, a federal agency that makes these numbers readily available. And as has already been mentioned, Nebraska has one of the most overcrowded prison systems in the country. In fact, the state's prison system was 115% over capacity, making it among the worst in the nation, which has already been said. And the measures that you all are seriously considering would help to address that. I, as Ashley mentioned in introducing me, under our campaign to end life imprisonment, we don't we want to focus solutions and efforts to scale back mass incarceration on some of the most extreme sentences that hold people accountable for very serious offenses. Most people in on um, a life sentence or in on a homicide offense. So we know that much of the conversation dominating challenging mass incarceration 
has been around nonviolent drug offenses. Those have been critical to helping scale back incarceration, but the overwhelming majority of people in state lockups in particular are in state prisons for violent offenses. And the extremeness that the United States responds to violent crime contributes to mass incarceration. Now, violent crime did increase in the United States in the 70s and 80s, but it also increased in other Western countries around the world. It increased in Germany, it increased in Finland. Those countries did not respond with um, an expansion of their prison systems in the way that the United States did. So even when seeking to hold people accountable, when seeking to meet the needs of persons victimized by crime and surviving crime, the response that the United States has when addressing violent crime is still extreme compared to other parts of the world, including other um, Western nations. I'll say that one key factor around that is looking at the life in prison population in Nebraska in particular, the number of people sentenced to life imprisonment today is 77% higher than the state's general population in 1970. That's um, similar to the growth nationally where actually there's more people nationally sentenced to people, sentenced to life in prison than there were total in prison in 1970 at the federal and state level. Nationally, there's about 206,000 people sentenced to life in prison. Um, that exceeds the general population um, that was in prison at the federal and state level in 1970. There have been changes in recent years that have helped to scale back the high rate of incarceration. As you all know, the United States has the highest rate of imprisonment in the world. There have been states that are seriously looking um, at changes to help reduce their prison population. And about seven states have reduced their prison population by over 30% since they peaked in the late 90s. Those include states from New Jersey to Alabama, I'm sorry, not Alabama, Alaska, California, and New York. And they've done that by um, addressing mandatory sentencing reform, by increasing the rate of parole for parole eligible individuals. And yet, even if those states continue um, to address reforms at the scale at which they're doing so. And if other states who haven't experienced a significant um, declines in their populations continue to do so, it will take 60 years for the United States to reduce its, po its prison population by 50%. So there is a lot of reform happening and people have been um, very quick to celebrate that as part of an era of mass incarceration reform. And yet the scale of reform that are getting adopted is nowhere near the spirit at which the uh, laws were adopted in the 70s and 80s that have contributed to the significant growth in the number of people imprisoned in the United States. So certainly the reforms that you all are seriously considering today that you all will have hearings on next week will help meet the spirit of what actually needs to be adopted in Nebraska to help address the chronic overcrowding problem and counter efforts to um, build a new prison that will that you all will be living with for a generation and that will shift significant if not millions of dollars away from various social policies into um, the prison system so I'll stop there um, uh, I you know I'm very encouraged by being able to participate with you all this afternoon and I'll just say that these reforms that you all are organizing and mobilizing around um, will hopefully help to meet the spirit of what actually needs to be done in Nebraska, given the chronic overcrowding that um, the state has experienced and has been experiencing for many years now. So thank you again, Ashley, for, for having me. Thank you so much, Nicole. Sorry, do you want to go, Jason? Yeah, I just wanted to ask real quick and just, it's a very general, question and I'm not asking for you to give statistics since you might not be correct but you spoke about like for instance the seven states who put part that reduced their population that stopped did the crime increase because that's something we keep really hearing is if you reduce the population of potential to put people in prison this means on us those of us living out in free society will suffer the consequences of all of these criminal activities that will rise 
has that reflect have you you know without necessarily being able to just dig into it right now have you seen a reflection of anything like that that is a great question and ruth mentioned that in the chat and no i appreciate that question jason i should have said that so i should not say so yes the answer to your question is yes that oh or no let me say it that way the answer to your question is no crime did not increase in the states that had substantial declines in their prison population of around 30 or more since they peaked in the mid 90s. Um, but that's true because overall nationally, the uh, violent crime rate had decreased. And, and it's also true in those states that did not see crime increase in the, in the aftermath of structural changes adopted that led to those declines in their prison population. I'll say, you know, as you all are having this conversation, there are serious um, discussions that need to be had around trends in crime. Um, since the pandemic, there have been a handful of jurisdictions that have experienced increases in violent crime. Um, but prison uh, pop prison policies don't aren't correlated um, to crime. And we know that because if you look at the graph in the 1990s, that charts the number of people in prison, the number of people in prison kept going up even though crime kept going down. Now people will say that there's a correlation, that there, there's a causation there, but that can't be true because um, any time that any reflection or any analysis of the state's prison population or the national prison population it will take time to see those numbers reflected in um, the uh, in national data and in national research, so um, the the immediate changes over the last couple of years has not resulted in an increase in crime in states like New York or Alaska that can be attributed to efforts to scale back punishment, given the mass incarceration that those states have experienced over the last couple of years. Thank you. That's great. Thank this you so much. Violent offenders. I'm sorry. And this would this number definitely includes violent offenders who receive these opportunities for persons who commit violence. Yeah, I, it, one of the key um, issues to address, and I think uh, perhaps Lindsay will touch on this, and Chris sort of he did touch on it in his comments earlier, is that people age out of crime, and so there are. Um, high rates of crime amongst young adults. Um, but even for young adults that commit crime, it's not endemic to their character or something that should be used to judge them for the rest of their life because most because crime peaks at the individual level in um, the late teens through the mid 20s. And then the crime, the uh, likelihood of committing crime declines and most people age out of crime. And there are also underlying causes that contribute to um, involvement in crime that might lead to justice involvement. And I'll say it again, even though I know that people um, in the United States don't like to compare themselves internationally, but other countries also experienced spikes in violent crime and will experience spikes in violent crime. They don't respond with the punitiveness that the United States does, and they don't fund their way out of violent crime trends through expanding prison beds. They um, address violent crime trends by expanding access to early childhood education, which is demonstrated to reduce interactions with law enforcement for communities and um, children at risk of law enforcement involvement. They expand services for um, low-income families for therapeutic interventions and other social services to reduce interactions with law enforcement. So there are other ways to meet concerns around violent crime that aren't wedded to expanding prison beds. And if this country wanted to have a more holistic response to violent crime, then it would also be centering those solutions as well, given that we know that mass incarceration has not solved um, problems around crime over the last 40 to 50 years. 
Yeah, it's really interesting. And obviously I do tread carefully uh, being a European in comparisons in the justice system. And I, the UK is not as different as I would like it to be from the American system. And it's starting to mirror it further as time goes on. But the sentencing I see is partly why I got involved in this uh, when I was o moved over for uh, college to the US. It's just a, a completely different culture entirely. In fact, life without parole in its purest form is outlawed in Europe uh, for people who aren't aware because everybody they determined is entitled to a right to hope at least. So it doesn't mean that you automatically get paroled. There are people that do spend their whole lives in prison depending on their crime and their lack of rehabilitation, but it's you cannot tell someone they never have a, ch a chance of getting out, which is quite interesting. Um, I actually spent my whole adult life before the US in U Europe's murder capital. It's called Glasgow in the UK, in Scotland. And while that sounds like a terrifying statistic, we just do not see the uh, levels of punishment, the levels of incarceration that, that is seen in the US, even though it does have a really scary title. So it is interesting, certainly. And thank you so much for that insight, Nicole. That was brilliant. Um, we'll move on to Lindsay, if that's okay, from the Juvenile Justice Institute at UNO uh, to give us a kind of academic insight um, and an overview of that. Yeah, hi, I'm Dr. Lindsay Wiley, um, and I'm the Director of Research at the Juvenile Justice Institute. Uh, my background is in psychology and law, so I've studied quite a bit um, in terms of juvenile brain development within the legal system. Um, so obviously the, the juvenile justice system was created to be a separate system, right? With the whole intention and goal of, of rehabilitation. So um, LB 34 kind of gives that opportunity for rehabilitation for those young people who are 18, 19 and 20. Um, I read a statistic from the Sentencing Project actually that said that, you know, that a good portion of um, prisons don't actually allow juveniles um, who have no chance of parole to even participate in any programs because in, in trying to reduce and save resources, they figure they, those services should only be available to those who might eventually get out of prison. Um, so much of this uh, focuses on the adolescent brain development and how children are just not the same as adults. And unfortunately, you know, for practical reasons, we often have to pick a cutoff age for something. And um, 18 has been mostly chosen for um, that cutoff point for what is considered to be a child. Um, but the adolescent brain development, as somebody mentioned, demonstrates that our brain really isn't done developing until age 25 or 26. So some of the characteristics of adolescent brain development that kind of make it um, them less culpable for punishment, um, this underdeveloped sense of responsibility um, and a, a less able to control impulses. Um, obviously the vulnerability to peer pressure and the uninformed nature of their character. So they really haven't developed yet. So I often ask people to think about like, what, what were you doing at 17, 18, 19? When I think about these kinds of decisions and the things that I was doing then, I obviously thought that I was a grown person, um, but in some of the decisions and the things that I thought were important, um, obviously demonstrate that I really didn't have capacity to understand my future consequences or how my current behavior would affect my future behavior. So not only the brain science, but also uh, there are legal factors that make it more um, challenging for juveniles in the legal system. They often have, um, they're less able to assist their counsel and defense in formulating um, a legal defense and participating in their legal defense. Um, and then they have a difficulty with interrogation. So we think about, um, I know most of America watched Making a Murder and looked at Brandon Dassey and his inability to um, participate in his own interrogation, that there are just legal factors that kind of make uh, the juvenile cases more, uh, make it more difficult for them. Um, specifically with the brain development. So the prefrontal cortex is the part of the brain that is developing. Um, well into our early 20s. And that's the part of the brain that's responsible for emotions, impulse control, um, the ability to assess risk and costs and benefits, as well as the ability to make future plans and really understand how those future plans impact us. Um, and then the other part is the cerebellum, which is kind of a newer part of the adolescent brain development science. Um, and what's different about the cerebellum 
was that it really relies on um, the, the growth of it is, is dependent on our environment. So if we think about the kinds of young people who are, um, who are committing these crimes, who are involved in the juvenile justice system, they, they most likely are coming from environments that are, not, um, that are not the most conducive for having a healthy brain development. So um, most of them come from homes where violence is common occurrence. Most of them were living in public housing, participating in special ed. Uh, most of them were not attending school. And then there's a high rate of um, both physical abuse and sexual abuse amongst these youth. So if you think about the types of things and situations and, and upbringing that youth who are involved in the system are encountering, it's not surprising that those youth are having even more difficulty or have even slower development um, in both the cerebellum and the prefrontal cortex. Um, and then lastly, the, the thing that is, um, uh, there, are, there are racial and ethnic disparities that um, occur with life without parole. So um, again, a statistic from the Sentencing Project that 23% of uh, black youth are, were arrested for um, with a white victim, but yet 42% ended up with life without parole. So there's obviously uh, racial and ethnic disparities that are affecting it at the level of sentencing um, that make, uh, kind of um, LB 34 really important for Nebraska, especially in terms of what Louis, 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 you got me with his name now, <laughs> I've talked about with our racial and ethnic disparities right here in Nebraska. That's great, thank you so much, Lindsay. And honestly, I'm just so happy somebody else made that mistake. So even if I caused it, that's totally fine. <laughs> so embarrassing, it was the whole time as well. <laughs> No, that's amazing. And I can't believe you got that amount of information into such a small amount of time. That is a real skill that I am quite clearly yet to develop. Um, but that's just it notes. <laughs> <laughs> if you can teach me your ways, that would be amazing. <laughs> uh, but that that's so good as well. And we had James Garbarino, who um, is, is quite um, famous for, for the brain science well on another panel. And yours was similarly just so, so interesting as to the factors that contribute and somebody had put a really good question in the, the uh, Q&A box earlier about uh, the services and housing and how all of that has, has a huge impact as well. I was recently um, on a, at a panel that was discussing that from Nebraska Appleseed's point of view who we're going to look to, to kind of pair up with as well and see because the, the causes of crime and the causes of um, you know poverty and things like that that all feed into it are so interesting and maybe not directly in our wheelhouse but it's it has to be looked at as a, as a whole holistic thing so thank you so much for that overview that was fantastic anything you want included in the, the email after as well i'll be getting in touch if there's any links you would like uh, included in that so thank you so much again yeah thank you for having me and um, so jason is our last speaker and we actually are doing pretty pretty good for time for one so that's really good and it's just to we always like to have a formerly incarcerated voice in anything that we do naturally the guys who are currently incarcerated can't be on these things at the moment certainly not with the technology in the Nebraska system hopefully one day that will be the case to get theirs directly but formerly incarcerated just as important and I'll maybe kind of pose, pose some questions to Jason as well about how um 34 you know is one thing we've heard quite a lot about that as well but a 624 in allowing people access to programming and then giving them the incentive to take part in that we discussed it briefly before and um, the incentive being the time off the minimum sentence currently in nebraska and as we didn't have an overview from john i'll provide a very quick one currently under the statute 191 to my knowledge, the, it allows you something like three days per month that can be earned off a sentence. It amounts to one year for every 10 years of programming that you do, and it comes off the top end of a sentence rather than the bottom end. So not only is it taking you so long to earn any real time, it's not acting as a real incentive, it's coming off the, the top end and not bringing you closer to parole, i.e. not having the impact it needs to on getting people out of the system. So 624 looks at increasing that, so you're getting the direct credit in time for what you're participating in. So if it's a month long rehabilitation program, say 
drug rehabilitation, something like that, you would get that one month off your sentence. If it's something more complex that develops skills that you then provide a service for, such as intentional peer support is a program in the Nebraska system, quite unique and really helps to de-escalate situations, keep staff safe and keep other guys incarcerated or women incarcerated safe as well. Uh, that takes six months, maybe slightly longer to do, and you would de therefore gain six months off your sentence. So it's directly related to how much time people incarcerated invest in themselves in you know showing that they're truly rehabilitated that's directly then given off the sentence in theory and that acts as the kind of incentivization uh, it has lots of benefits obviously getting people out of the system making sure people are much more equipped to deal with outside life have much more skills to offer for a workplace or for just kind of reintegrating back into society and we believe and the the research seems to suggest that the more programming the less harm that, that can come to staff because there is a less bad behavior being partaken in and less free time to kind of get bored and uh, potentially kind of cause trouble i don't want to do make this situation sound juvenile but to uh, not have anything to lose kind of thing so be really interested in jason's take on that and how that would have affected your time in prison because I know that you weren't always on the rehabilitation train while you were in and things like that so if you can just give us a kind of background of that what your thoughts are yeah that's true uh wasn't always on the rehabilitation train and I think what you said when you said uh don't want to make it like juvenile that say incentives for this and people if they don't have something to do get in trouble nothing about prison is juvenile except the juveniles that we put in our prison system and that should speak in itself for but uh, incentives are everywhere. I don't know if any of us has a job, even a job we love that doesn't have incentives. So incentives are opportunity to find hope and inspiration in what you're trying to move forward in. But even if that's not existent, speaking of prison, with these incentives of, you know, earned time, which is essential good time, uh, it gives you a chance to be exposed to something that you wouldn't next to, you know, you're in prison. It's a horrible environment. It's an environment where almost everybody that comes in, whether we recognize it or not, comes in with some sort of trauma. And then we're in an environment that increases the trauma. And it's not just being locked up, but there's all of us that are, the way we adapted to survival is not very great for the rest of the people around us. And so when we get together, there's gonna be fights and there's gonna be all these things that we do that are not, above above ground i guess i would say and with that being said is you know we usually don't come out our old behavior or it gets worse our negative behavior with this it's saying you know for one if you don't care about change would we'll use that example i don't care about change i go into the system but i do care about getting out i see that ray of light at the end i care about getting out i i entertain ideas of doing something different I'm not coming back here or being with my family, whether I'm genuine about change. And then I get opportunities to uh, reduce my time, but I have to go to this program. I have to go to that program. And you'll be amazed at how many people, and sometimes it takes several times, several different programs that when you're going to program, it might just be one part that like speaks to you. You don't want to tell everybody, you know, oh, this program spoke to me, but it speaks to you and you take that with you. And then there's something else you're exposed to. And that's how the train of change happens. That's how the train of change happened in my case. And in my case, it was a little bit more dramatic, but just to simplify it, it was other men locked up. And a lot of them did a long time, including Dwayne that was on here, uh, if he still is, that were out there talking about something different than what we were living, educating themselves and bringing that to me, which is kind of uh, the essence of what you spoke of Ashley about the IPS, the intentional peer support, is the people who were once part of this problem, once in this negative behavior, not only taking ownership, but learning how to use this past experience to connect with somebody and to help them walk a different path. And so this bill gives that potential of exposure to people who may not want to hear it. This bill also gives that potential of a uh, benefit to people who are changing and looking for change and participate. And we want people to program in a good, the best way that word could be used, that word is not always a great word, but we want people to 
do different programs than what prisons already programmed to do. And that's um, cycle us back into the community, into the same behavior that brings us right back into the prison system. That's what prison initially programmed to punish you. And when you're done getting your spanking, you're gonna go out to community angry again. And we'll see if you adapt well. I would like to answer uh, somebody, Pina, I'm gonna use your last name because I'm not sure I had that pronounced, but you spoke about, you know, people who were doing, uh, children doing life sentences and have gotten out as adults, of course, because we hardly ever correct our problem within a year or two or four. It always seems like 20 years later. I know more than, I know about half dozen of the Nebraska youth who uh, were resentenced for life sentences, but I know even more people who had homicide cases out here in the community. And none of them that I know personally that I have interaction with, you know, I come across them in the community doing whatever, not one of them are exercising any criminal behavior in their life. Not one. Nicole. Yeah, I just wanted to say, you know, I think people, I think the general sort of narrative around homicide is that um, it's like this, it's about the person's character because, you know, people, the overwhelming majority of people don't commit homicides. So people can't imagine that it's possible or, and that they could, they themselves would ever do that. But the reality is for most homicides, it's situational. It, you know, drugs and alcohol are often um, a part of the situation clouding uh, people's judgment that leads to the fatal outcome. It doesn't excuse it, but that is what the system is for, holding people accountable for an act that may have results that may that victimized people and and um, led to someone's uh, a fatal outcome, and it's the, but the it's the idea that the system we have now assumes that that act is so endemic to the person's character that they are beyond they are beyond change, and um, that is the problem with the way the United States responds to homicide and the extreme punitiveness that orients the system. Not only are most homicides situational and um, you know, there are circumstances around drug and alcohol that are involved with them, but in addition to the finding you just shared, Jason, based on your personal experience and personal interactions that you've had, there's a handful of studies that follow people convicted of homicide and released from prison for homicide that also mirrors your experience with very low rates of recidivism um, for people um, convicted after a term of years in prison for homicide. And I also say that the trends around life imprisonment and the extreme sentences that people are currently subjected to has changed you know, over the last 40 to 50 years, which is also an underlying cause for growth of imprisonment in Nebraska and nationally. The national trend for homicide in the early, in the early 80s was actually about 15 years on average prison term for people sentenced for homicide. So the, the length of time in prison has lengthened, which is also a contributing factor to why Nebraska has such an overcrowding um, situation and also nationally why there's been such a growth of the number of people in prison as well. Yeah. And I'll just keep this short. Uh, well, as you said, in simple layman terms, most people that commit uh, some sort of homicide are not serial killers like you see on TV or have a killer mentality like now the next time something happens, I'm going to kill somebody. You're, you're stating there's a situation that came up and maybe a lifestyle lived or whatever that makes an explosion that wouldn't be occurring over and over and over without them situations, which hence these people that have gotten out are community members as opposed to walking around dangerous individuals that at any moment may do this, which is a concept that we need to get over is that we need people to just respect and obey and our system just, it's corrective ways of just putting you in there where you just respect or obey and, or get more punishment is not the way. Accountability is about building into the person, which is what the, the brothers taught me that you don't hold me accountable, I do. 
you may have to operate in some ways at some point, like, hey, you need to slow, but then it's me that needs to take the accountability and make the decisions that like, yeah, this is not what I'm gonna do. Or this impulse, I'm not gonna follow this impulse. Or if I'm down this wrong trap, wrong path, that I need to take the decision to whatever it is, like, um, for example, an addiction, maybe I need to take the, uh, the steps to go to treatment, to ask somebody for help, to do, do this, to find these tools that don't become detrimental to myself and society around me in the community. But uh, thank you, uh, Ashley and the Nebraska Prison Reform for having this. The, uh, I'm sorry, anybody, that we didn't answer your questions, but hopefully this will form more conversations and look at these bills coming up here in Nebraska. We need uh, we need to, as individuals, speak to our groups that surround us about these elements. We also need to open our mind to change. And as Lewis represents on the larger scale, but there's a lot of smaller scales that people who've been inside or who've been through the trouble, who are the leaders in their community for reform in them aspects, who are the leaders in their community to reach out and help other communities that they may not have never uh, had that actual experience. They just feel compelled to like, accountability for me accountability for me is to make sure that i'm contributing to society actively and so thank you yeah thank you for that jason that's great and just very quickly two of the things that were said one by nicole about the sentencing for anyone most people who are not aware in nebraska the sentencing has really got out of control not only the number of people but the length of sentence and uh, many people know tom riley quite a famous defense attorney in nebraska and i was recently speaking to him and he just described how the most maximum sentence you could imagine for a crime is now the absolute standard in Nebraska. Many people are done for first degree murder for crimes that no member of the public would recognize as first degree murder. And then it kind of goes down from there. And that's why we are in the situation that we're in essentially. So uh, a big problem there. And the point that you made Jason about the exposure to programming, it was very disappointing to see director Frakes speak out against LB 624. And his logic was firstly, uh, something that I tweeted that I truly couldn't believe. He said that they're not capable, uh, people incarcerated are not capable of looking to the future, that they just live day to day. And I think that says a lot about why people in Nebraska are not getting the programming they need or not getting the opportunities they need because they're seen to not be able to, to handle that, which, which is a really bizarre um, take on things I think and as you were saying which we wholeheartedly believe not everybody does want to do programming but if there's that carrot on the stick that makes people do it and they think oh well I'll just go to this I'll phone it in if you have to sit through something there is almost always something that resonates with you something that goes in something that relates to what you've been through or what you're experiencing and you benefit from that almost whether you like it or not um, and the only I'd, I've never been in that situation naturally, but even with kind of schooling, I was a very lazy student. I really didn't want to fulfill any of the potential that I apparently had, but I was made to go as children are. And then I went on to, to college and things. And, and I did learn so much that I didn't necessarily think that I was going to, or, you know, I just wanted the piece of paper at the end, but I learned so many skills that you don't even realize. And that's the same with programming. It's, it's no different from out here. It's a, the same situation where you will benefit and they you know, the people incarcerated will be better equipped to come out and will have um, really gained something from that programming. So that's great. Thank you so much, Jason. Always an invaluable perspective from someone who's been. Sorry, just muting myself there. And um, the last thing, that's everything. So the last thing is just a very quick overview of the things that you can do to be involved. So I will send out a follow-up email as I've discussed with links from the speakers, anything they want to include, as well as links to all of these that are here. So there's a few more options than there usually are due to COVID. Um, you can naturally contact your centers via email call like you can about everything. You can submit comments online this year, which is really good and will provide the links to 34 and 624 to do that, but it, it counts for any bill. You can do that for any bill that's um, being introduced this legislative session. 
a submit a letter for the record. That's extremely important. And for 624, we were absolutely delighted to have 17 letters in, as well as two written testimony, which I'll come to, which was absolutely fantastic. We, it was quite short notice. We didn't have a lot of time to rally people. And that's what we got. So that was amazing. We want to really exceed that for 34, which obviously kind of relies on you guys uh, doing so, which will be amazing. And we'll be posting more about that. Submitting written testimony while a letter for the record can be done remotely and it's just done by email to the committee's email address. Submitting written testimony has to be done in person on the morning of the hearing. So that would be uh, 8.30 to 9.30 on the 17th for LB34, which we'll advise of in the email as well. And that's if you can't attend or don't want to speak in front of the committee, which is completely understandable for people. Uh, the very last one, and I guess the kind of top tier in some respects is giving in-person testimony. So anybody who would like to do that at 34 feels strongly enough to do so. I had mentioned earlier that I had asked Chris if there was space and, and he's advised yes. So we'll be posting more details about that and uh, making sure that everybody who wants to can attend. Uh, I saw Danielle posted a link on giving public testimony and things like that. So we'll include all of that in the, the emails to make sure everyone has it. And as always, I will incessantly be posting things on the page that nobody can ever miss because I don't seem to ever stop. So you'll get that as well. And the very last thing is for anybody, it's, it's all over our social media, um, but for anybody who wants to follow us, uh, there's a Twitter, there's a Facebook, there's now a Facebook page and two separate groups, a general group for communication and a specific one for people who have the time and want to be directly involved. There's no shame in not joining that one, it's not a problem, but it is a more accountable group for people, you know, getting in directly involved and doing things that are posted, calls to action and things like that. So if it is something you think you have the time for, um, certainly do that. As I said, I will include all the links to these in the follow-up email. And that's our email address, which you will have naturally when I email you out and any questions can go to there. Um, they'll be answered and, and we can direct you to other things.